By the end of this project, this is what our power amplifier module will look like. You can download the source files from a link in the description. Make sure to hop into Altium Designer and follow along. Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to be doing a PCB layout for the power amp module that we showed in an earlier video on RF power amp. Now, in the earlier video right there at the end, I showed an example schematic for one of the components that we were looking at in the video. We went over some concepts and then we looked at some specifications for some different power amplifiers. And then finally, I put together some schematics for the power amplifiers that we were looking at in that earlier part of the video. We're going to do the PCB layout today, so make sure to hop into Altium Designer, follow along, and let's get started. So now that we're back into this project, I'm going to update the PCB. Now in this project, you may remember I used one of the Hittite microwave power amplifiers that we looked at in the earlier video. And if you want to watch that earlier video, check out the link in the description. You'll be able to learn more about power amplifiers and see some of the components that we're talking about. So I've got everything here in the PCB. And we have a few important components here. This power amplifier is basically going to take in a 12 volt input for power. It is going to output a 6 gigahertz signal approximately. And that 6 gigahertz signal is being generated by this voltage controlled oscillator. It's going over here to our power amp. And then that power amp outputs through J1. And that then is going to connect to a coaxial cable. So this is an SMA connector. It goes to a coax cable. That coax cable can go to an antenna module like the patch antenna module that we showed in a previous video. Let's go over here and start doing some placement. So first things first, one of the things that I really like about these SMA connectors that you can get through the manufacturer part search panel is that you will notice it includes a region here in this mechanical layer that shows the extent of this coaxial plug coming off of the edge of the board. The other thing that's really cool about it is, of course, it marks where the board edge is. And so you can get those pads right up to the edge because this particular connector is going to mount basically like this, as you see here in the 3D view. So you can see it's coming off the edge just like this, and then it's going to solder right here. Now, because of that, you have to make sure that when you set the stack up, you set the stack up to the right value. And so that stack up needs to be about 65 mils, and you can get the exact number from the data sheet. These can technically work just fine with just solder on these top three pins. However, just for extra durability, let me zoom out here, you would also want to get some solder on these bottom pins here on the bottom side of the SMA connector. So just keep that in mind when you set the board stack up. So we're going to output through this top edge, and then we will come in through this bottom edge. And then for anyone who's going to look at this and complain, don't worry, we're going to change the board size, but I'm just kind of doing some initial floor planning here. U1 is our power amplifier, so that's going to be somewhere in the middle. Then we're going to have a bunch of power supplies, and then of course our VCO. So U2 is our VCO. And so we're generally going to follow this bottom to top kind of topology, and the output from U2 right here on pin number eight has to go direct into this input here on the power amplifier. So we'll go ahead and get some of this stuff placed. We'll then come back and do, uh, do the board size so we can get this nice and compact. Now, one thing I want to do before we finish placement is talk about the stack up. Now, the stack up, of course, needs to be thick enough so that ideally you could solder both sides of those SMA edge connectors, but not too thick because, of course, if it's too thick, it's not going to fit in between those teeth on the SMA edge connector. For this stack up, we want to route 50 ohm lines in between U2 and U1, and then from U1 all the way out to J1. And we want to make sure that we can do this with appropriate isolation in this board. We're going to have one switching regulator and then some other power components on here that could conduct noise or radiate noise, which could then be received on these RF lines. And of course, we want to prevent that. So in order to do that, my recommendation for this type of board would be a four layer stack up. So technically with this board, we could get everything onto one layer. It doesn't have a really high component count. It's going to be a small board. 
So we could get everything onto the top layer. And I think in most cases, a designer would say, well, I can get all my components onto the top layer, therefore I'm just gonna use a two layer board. That's pretty much what the explanation is or the justification is for most two layer boards. In this case though, because we need number one, controlled impedance, and then number two, we wanna make sure that we have as much shielding as possible on those RF lines, I would recommend using a four layer board. Using a four layer board, we can get the outer layer thicknesses to be relatively thin. That's gonna provide the tightest coupling between the RF signal traces and ground, and then that will reduce parasitic or inductive coupling to other circuitry in the circuit board. So I'm gonna add a layer here, just add a signal layer, and when I add this layer, you're gonna notice, of course, it sets it as prepreg with a DK 4.1. Now, what thickness should we use on the outer layer? Well, you can get four or five mil laminates that are around DK4 from Isola or from iTech or some other laminate vendors. And here, we're gonna go with a five mil outer laminate, as I'll explain the reason for being for that here in just a moment. We're gonna leave the DK at 4.1 for now. The DF value is probably gonna come out to 0 0.02, so we'll just go ahead and leave that. And then we'll make up the rest of the thickness here um, in this inner layer. The other thing about this uh, inner layer is I'm just gonna leave this here as DK 4.8. The inner layer thickness isn't gonna matter for us, and that is because I'm gonna make layer number two ground, and I'm gonna make layer number three ground. And layer number four is actually not going to be used for anything. The reason for that is because, as I said, we're gonna be able to get everything onto a single layer, which is just gonna be our top layer, and so we're not gonna worry about what's going on on the bottom layer. Next, for the impedance, I'm gonna do a quick impedance calculation, and I wanna do this as single coplanar lines. In order to get the cost down for this, we actually discussed this a little bit in an earlier video, we don't want to have the clearance here be too small. So I'm gonna set the clearance here to six mils, and that's gonna be at the lower limit of what the fabrication house I'm gonna work with can do without bumping me up to a different cost here. So that one mil of clearance change really changes the cost for this board. So that's why I'm setting this to six mils. Now here we have our width, we have our target impedance at 50, and we have our clearance. The last thing that we would need here to really get a highly accurate value for the impedance calculation would be to include a roughness model. I'm gonna include the modified Hammerstead, and we're going to set one micron roughness. That's probably what you'll expect from the copper foil that's gonna be used in this board. And here you can see it doesn't really have a huge change in the impedance here. That would be different if we were looking well above Wi-Fi frequencies. And you can see here our 7.76 mil width is gonna work just fine. So we'll go ahead and save that. Then we'll go ahead and we'll start implementing that here in just a moment as we set up the uh, design rules. Now, one thing that I wanna do is create a class. And the reason I'm gonna create a class is because when I set up the design rule for the RF routing, I wanna make sure that when I have that design rule set, it's only applied to certain nets. So this class, I'm just gonna call my RF nets and we're gonna add specific members to that class. So one of these is gonna be net C71. You'll notice that net C71 is connected to capacitor, of course, C7. We can see where C7 is right over here. We're gonna grab this guy, and we'll go ahead and move that one over here so we can see what's going on. We also need to grab net C72 and put it into our RF class, and then once we put those into our RF class, we'll then need to put the output net into the RF class as well. The output net is going to be connected to J1. Here you can see from J1, we actually have this connected to something else here. So that would be C6. So we also have to grab C6. So they were gonna need to get the LO out and then net C6 too. So those are our four nets that we need to add into our class. So if you go down here to classes, RF, you can go to net C6 2, LO out, and then net C7 1 and 2 add those over, and then we're good. So we're gonna use that net class to apply our impedance profile as a design rule so that it only applies to those nets. The rest of the design rules are gonna be the default design rules or the standard design rules that we set in the rules and constraints editor, and they'll apply to all the other traces. So I'm gonna go through now to the rules and constraints editor, and when I do the routing width, 
I want this uh, first width to apply to all nets. And we can just set, you know, our min width is, let's say, six. Our preferred width is 10. We can set our max width at, let's say, 50. And we can have anything in between. But now we want to have an additional design rule. And this new design rule, we're going to call width RF. And this one is only going to set the impedance profile for a specific net class, and that is our RF net class. So now we've implied of that impedance profile only to those RF nets, and that's gonna set the width that we need for controlled impedance. Now I have most of the placement done here, and I've defined a board shape, and it's a pretty small board. You can see that it's two inches by, I believe, 1.85 inches. So like I said, pretty small board. Looks like 1.86 inches. So with this board, I wanna run through the placement justification briefly, and then I'm gonna end up taking this home and finishing all the routing. J6 is our 12 volt input. And we're doing a 12 volt input through a SMA connector, just like they did on the evaluation board. Now it's coming in here to this power regulator circuit. You can see here, I've done the regulator circuit reasonably tight, trying to do it all on one layer. And with this little six pin chip here, for the regulator, it gets a little difficult to keep it tight like that because, of course, this feedback resistor network um, ends up having to route around all of this stuff. And so, like I said, it can get a little wonky there. What I'll probably end up doing is routing this 5-volt line on the back layer so that back layer won't get totally wasted. We can use that back layer for some of the other power rails as well to route around to some of these other components. Now, U3 is our dual rail power output chip. So this dual rail converter outputs our negative two volts, which is needed for this gate voltage over here. And then it also outputs at three volts. And so the three volts is needed over here for our tuning voltage and for the supply for U2. So this is another one where, because it's really tight on this layer, what we'll need to do is drop some vias and then put some rails on the back layer to go over here to the three volt line right here. That will then get bridged over to VCC with a jumper. And then same thing over here with the negative two volt rail. That can go over here to this pin and then get bridged over to VGG with a jumper. Now, one of the main reasons I've left these as jumpers is of course, it's very easy to just power them on manually if you're just using jumpers. That's pretty simple. If I didn't have jumpers here, what I would have to do is use a power sequencer chip, or if you really want to get complex, you could do it with a microcontroller and then toggle on these different rails. The other reason is that if one of these rails is malfunctioning, what I can do is I can just hook one of these pins up to my power supply, and then I can toggle on the required voltage manually without having to worry about debugging this power converter. So I can just totally bypass it if I need to. So the last thing in this placement is U2. Now in U2, my output is right here on pin eight. And so we would route a coplanar line going from here into C7, C7 blocks DC, and then that output goes here to my power amplifier. Power amplifier then goes to my bias T. So I place my bias T with L1 right here. And this jumper will probably move down maybe somewhere over here in this region. But the jumper needs to take the 12 volt input coming off of J6. We'll take that 12 volt input from the back rail and then we'll go ahead and jumper that here to VDD. So this is my power for the power amplifier as I explained in the other video. And then our output just routes straight into J1 and that's how we complete this layout. The reason I've done it like this is of course, I've got all of the power stuff in the lower left section of the board and there's a decent amount of distance between everything that's going on on the power rail and the RF lines over here um, on this side of the board. The other thing that you should notice, and this can be a persistent problem with switching regulators and RF circuits is, of course, this switching node. Switching node is located in this region down here in the lower left portion of the board. So it is pretty much as far away as you can possibly get it in the circuit board from any of the RF stuff. So that's also going to help keep the noise down. And it should really emphasize the importance of taking advantage of the space you have available in the PCB layout in order to try and prevent noise 
from getting into nets where you don't want it. And in this case, that would be into these RF nets. Now, what I could have done is taken U2 and extended it out down here. That would require routing a longer coplanar line. So it would look a lot more interesting for sure. However, it would then open up much more space or a greater region where noise could couple from the switching regulator circuitry over here into the RF lines over here. So for example, if I were to move this down like this, it would require routing the coplanar line all the way up along this region. Well, that's a much larger region for coupling over here into the switching node and some of these other components in the switching regulator. And that would allow a greater opportunity for more noise to be received on this RF line. So if you can, tight routing on the RF lines is also beneficial because it helps prevent reception of noise on the RF lines. I'm okay with the placement as it is so far. What I'm gonna do is take this home and I'm gonna finish it up at home and we'll get it routed and then we'll be able to see what it looks like. Well, this is how the project came out and this is what the power amplifier module looks like. I'm pretty happy with it. Did a little bit of shifting on the pin headers and renumbered a couple of designators just to get this all consistent. And then you can see I added some silk screen here to help call out those voltages. And then the other thing I did here was this dual rail supply got moved down a little bit and rotated so it was a little easier to make those connections. And then if you look at the back layer, you'll be able to see where some of the power polygons are routed in order to provide that 5 volt and 12 volt signal to different points on the board. Make sure to check out the link in the description and you can download the source files and use them in your own projects. Thanks for watching everybody. This is a pretty simple board, but it should illustrate some of the important concepts that are involved when laying out a power amplifier PCB. So placement is important, routing is important, and of course, where you place some of those power circuits can be really important for ensuring that your RF section operates with as minimal noise as possible. Thanks for watching everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. Of course, leave all your comments and questions in the comment section. We've been getting some great questions lately and I love getting your questions. And I apologize if I'm a little late to answering some of those questions because as I said, we've been getting so many of them because you guys are enjoying all these videos so much. Thanks again, everybody. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.